I was going to move to the United States, but I just don't think I could live there. It was very dangerous. And then the homelessness is just an absolute epidemic. I've been all around proper third world countries. At least they look after each other. But if someone falls to the bottom in America, they're done. So you're in America. Tell me about how that was. America's a very strange place. Mm. I've got friends out there that have moved over there from the UK because the job opportunities are much better. There seems to be a more of a cultural revival underway because yeah. there's still uh, the ability to go and live off grid, form communities, be Christians without being actively attacked. But the scale of everything was just dizzying. And, and yeah. we both said that. So we went to Austin briefly. Mm -hmm. And I said this on Tim's show. Americans tolerate things that the English would at least have some contempt for. Yeah. Like they walk around listening to screaming crackheads like it's bird song. Yeah. I just don't <laughs> obviously like we we still have we didn't have their asylums that were broken up asylum system not meaning migration but mm. mental health. We didn't have their opioid crisis which then developed into the fentanyl addiction crisis so we don't have the same conditions but how are you just going about your day setting up your food truck as some old man is having a conversation with the demons that only he can see. Like, I, mm. I just, no, no thanks. The the urban decay is unpleasant. Yeah, I mean, I was sitting at a cafe in Austin and yeah, the, the homelessness crisis is obviously a massive problem, but even just the wokeness in Austin, I couldn't believe it because I thought that this was the place that Rogan had moved to and all of these other people had moved to to get away from LA. But there was pentagrams everywhere. We well, were looking at I, pentagrams on T-shirts and pentagrams tattooed on necks. And there was uh, a witchcraft shop right opposite my hotel that had a pentagram in the in the window. Yeah. And you could tell because it felt like there were summoning demons for the people that were walking on the on the pavement. The only <laughs> thing that I can imagine is the mass exodus out of California with folks mm. like Michael Malice and Rogan. Comparatively, if you move from the seventh circle of hell up to the sixth, <laughs> it, well, everything looks rosy. You know, <laughs> like it's, I think they're anesthetized to the urban decay because again, Americans seem to put up with things yeah. on, on the basis of what was it? John Stewart said. Uh, like crackheads assaulting you on the tube is basically the price of freedom. Mm. It's like, you actually don't have to live like this, you know? Like, yeah. Just, of course, unmitigated freedoms, yeah, this is the consequence. But you, you can have some standards. You can not live in a cesspit. That would be preferable. Yeah. I was going to move to the United States. And I was, I was asking my audience, where's the best place to go? People were saying places like Nashville and Charlotte. But I just don't think I could live there. Yeah, I think I might have to move to a more conservative country in Europe, even though all of the opportunities are obviously in America. I just don't think I could live there. What was too alien for you? I would say the it was very dangerous. People don't really know this who live in America, but other countries are actually way less dangerous than America. We we heard gunshots twice. Once we were in Nashville and there was we just heard boom, boom, boom. And like I've never even really heard gunshots. I'm from Australia, from the Sunshine Coast, like the, one of the safest places in the world. And then we looked on the news the next day and someone had been murdered around the corner from us. Like there was some, someone had driven a car past and done some, some gang shooting. And then we heard the same thing in Austin as well. So that's bad. And then the homelessness is just an absolute epidemic. I mean, I've been all around Thailand, Cambodia, places like this, like proper third world countries, spent a lot of time there. At least they kind of look after each other in a way. But if someone falls to the bottom in America, they're done. I think that's a social contract. It's essentially if... The only standard you have to have are living up until the parameters of the law. One, the law becomes a set of guidelines around which you can circumvent. Mm. And two, if it's so explicit, then you don't have to show social consideration because it's like, oh, the law or the institutions will take care of this person. I don't have to do anything about it. Perfect example of that was, I think it was two years ago now, a woman was getting raped on the tube in Philadelphia and everyone was just filming it. It was a sort of mythical... Kitty Genovese case that people mm. hear about of where a woman was getting attacked, everyone could hear from the apartment blocks, but instead they were just looking out their windows rather than calling the police. People did actually call the police. Yeah. But it's that bystander effect. I think that's engendered by the American law, especially because the influence of Christianity has waned. For me, I mean, it was the the litter, the graffiti, the urban decay. The dangerousness is very much right. I was speaking to my girlfriend about this because she was asking how my trip was. I got back yesterday and she sort of smothered me because she couldn't go two weeks without me. Of course. <laughs> uh, but we were looking at the per capita like car accident mm. stats because I was saying the American road, rule, road rules are really weird. Their, their crosswalks aren't like they stop all at the same time. They're just, and you can still turn yes. right or left as you're walking across. The weirdest thing kept happening whenever we'd be standing on, a, on the side of the road. In Australia, you kind of like walk out and then the car just goes past and then you go to the middle and then the car, but they all like stop for you. And I was like, why are you keep stopping for me? It's almost like I lose respect for you when you do that. Just drive. And then I realized that they all just sue the pants of each other. Yeah, quite. <laughs> well, well, we were looking it up and, and we said, okay, per capita, how many road accidents are there? And I think in the UK, it's about. 26 per 100,000 people. Mm. And in America, it's like 138 per 100,000 people. So 
just nearly like nearly a, a factor of ten or whatever. Uh, and there's just something about the US where people are just slightly crazier. Mm. I mean, at the other end of the scale, there was a Telegraph piece on this about a year ago of where the US can either be a one or ten depending on how successful you are. If you're rich, the US is paradise. If you're poor, US is a circle of hell. Yep. In Britain, no matter how rich you are, it's kind of a five out of 10, no matter where you go. Yeah, yeah. we but, noticed this ex when we were in the US. I said that if I lived in a place like Nashville, you'd have to sort of insulate yourself from the... Nashville is very nice. It was my favorite place. I could potentially see myself living there, but you'd still have to insulate yourself from all of the ghettos, for example. You can do it, but like you said, if you are poor, then th these places are just not very nice whatsoever. I mean, what do you see contributing to the cultural decline in America? What do you what do you think are the biggest factors? This will be very taboo to say, but I think it's that essentially white America and black America exist as two parallel countries within the same country. I completely agree. I mean, because of course you've got the, the Republicans and the Democrats, which they live as if they're separate countries in the same country. This is where national divorce won't really work because mm. they'll never leave each other alone. Uh, I, I say that much more about the Democrats and the Republicans being sort of like liberal imperialists. But when I was walking around Washington, D.C., if you spend time on Capitol Hill, it's beautiful, it's clean, the architecture is neoclassical, everyone's sort of polite and relatively high trust, even though there are many snakes in the swamp, so mm -hmm. to speak. But when you're going around the museums, they're all tourists or white Americans. Most of the staff are the black Americans that live in the area. Yep. And so I was thinking, well, why, why aren't there many black Americans walking around here? And why do the guards not really pay any attention to the artwork or the exhibits? I mean, if you see them day in, day out, you might get anesthetized to it. Yep. But they're on their phones, they're shouting aloud, they're talking to one another. They don't, they don't really look like they like or feel any affinity to the people that are looking around their, their artifacts. And then my friend drove me through the ghettoized areas on the way to visiting the, the big Catholic Basilica, which is absolutely beautiful. Brutally run down, very dangerous, open air drug deals. Lots of the drug addicts disproportionately were black people in Austin, in the US. The amount of, did you see this when you were in Austin? The amount of drug addicts in wheelchairs. Yeah. And it's not like they're military vets most of the time. It's because they've taken so much heroin, they've had to have limbs hacked off or because they're ODing just sat down and it's way easier to get around like that. So there is social decay, a set of perverse cultural incentives, and a set of, I think, racial antagonisms from one group to another group, from black America to white America, it doesn't seem to flow the other direction, even though popular narratives say it does. Mm -hmm. That means that they're living in parallel, but always at odds. And it feels like they're just sort of sitting on a cultural tinderbox there. Mm -hmm. It wasn't very comfortable to be around. I wonder about solutions there, because... I do think that those cultures are very diametrically opposed to each other. And I do I cover a lot of race politics in terms of the American culture war on my channel. And some of the things that I think that Americans that the black Americans do really have a, a a proper gripe about, for example, you know, they do have something to say about the fact that they were slaves for hundreds of years. Nowadays none of them have experienced it. But also the crack epidemic, and then you know that the USA, the government actually brought crack into the ghettos. They do, and the prison industrial complex, for example, I think they do have some things to be pissed off about, but it's magnified to the point where they actually seem to really dit, like not like white people. And that's very concerning because if you look at other examples like South Africa, it doesn't end well. I don't know if you saw they had the kill the Boer. Kill Julius Malema chanting it at his rally, yes. Yeah, and I, I just, I'm, I'm not very optimistic about the future of America. No, I, yeah. don't, I don't think so in the slightest. I think if you... They, call, they keep talking about institutional racism, but that's just sort of a, an academic cover for we hate white people. Hmm. If they were to talk about institutional racism, they could talk about, for example, Lyndon B. Johnson, who in the 1960s, according to Doris Kearn, in, his, in, her, auto, in her biography of him, said that we're going to have these black Americans, he's an expletive, voting Democrat for the next hundred years because mm -hmm. he hooked them up to the welfare system and desolated the black family. I mean, Thomas Sowell's written compellingly about this. Uh, black people in the 1930s had a higher level per capita of family cohesion, marriage rates, um, in some areas higher GDP than the white Americans. You had Black Wall Street, for example. So they had a very cohesive, enterprising culture post-Civil War, pre-Civil Rights. Uh, civil Rights are obviously conducted by many communists mm. and the like. And so there have been policies, uh, downwardly mobile cultural incentives to encourage criminality, encourage family breakup, encourage welfare dependency mm. in black America. But the finger has never pointed to that because, of course, the critical race theory types yep. and their willing accomplices in the press and the media would like to ratchet up the power of the state, manufacture consent for the expansion of uh, clientele welfare programs mm. and the like. And so instead, they just point to their white American neighbors and go, 
he's at fault when yeah. he's just trying to coexist and subsist as the government's also taking his money at the same time. You can't help but feel like I'm really sorry for them though. When I was over there, I was uh, in Miami and I was staying in this hotel and then I, w- I looked down into the swimming pool and there was these three big black ladies making all of this noise. So I was like, I'm going to go make friends with them. So I went down to the pool and I started talking to them. They were all baby mamas. They all had their kids at home. They were all single mums. And the way that they said it to me was that it was just like nothing. We're just all single mums, you know, all of our kids at home, different baby daddies. And I was like, that, that is a sickness of culture. We know what happens when the father is removed from the home. But the way that they're, the way that the cultural messaging is given to them, it's like that none of it's your fault. You don't have to be introspective about your culture whatsoever. It's all to, to do with the white man. I, I just don't really see a way forward for them. No, it's it's inducing a state of arrested development in an entire subset of your population. And then, because they don't feel listened to or whatever, or they have racial grievance, every four to eight years they express this in the form of a riot, they burn down their own neighbourhoods, they burn down the more enterprising small businesses mm. and life savings that have been, been put into these like startups and bars um, from the local community and then large corporations come in and gentrify the area and mm. homogenize everything because they're subsidized by the government that also keeps them hooked up onto welfare it's because like a russian nesting doll faith family a sense of community um, congregation cultural historical ethnic identity and then your nation they fit together to insulate you from being naked to state tyranny. Mm. And the black Americans, even from the slavery narrative that is, because people live on stories they tell themselves, right? The slavery narrative that they tell themselves through media like Roots or Black Panther or just word of mouth, um, or the racial grievance narrative saying that white people, not necessarily all these government programs, are responsible for my impoverishment. They never put into action the personal responsibility required to insulate themselves from being wards of the state. And so this cycle just begets more single motherhood, more criminality, uh, more welfare dependency, more violence, and more misery. If you enjoyed that reality-based podcast clip, make sure to subscribe to the reality-based YouTube channel. We'll be uploading many clips and the full podcast. And also, if you prefer the audible version, you can check us out on Spotify and Apple Podcasts at Reality Based.